Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, a frequently asked questions panel on HPV prevention and treatment in special populations. My name is Jessica Monmini, and I am the Senior Education Associate at ARHP. I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to share how you can receive continuing education credits for this webinar. In order to receive credit, you must take the pre and post test. If you have not yet taken the pre test, please click the link provided to you in the reminder email or via the webinar's chat box. You are also welcome to use the chat and question box to ask questions throughout the webinar, which our presenters will answer at the end. About an hour after the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive an email from Caitlin Borzowitz, ARHP Communication and Education Associate, with a link to the post-test survey. The continuing education certificate will be generated upon completion of that survey. In four weeks, you will receive another email with a link to a follow-up evaluation. We ask that you complete this evaluation to let us know how you've incorporated what you've learned during this webinar into your work. Completing the pre- and post-test, as well as this follow-up evaluation, helps ARHP ensure that we continue to meet your educational needs and interests. Thank you in advance for your time and feedback. At this time, I would like to introduce Craig Roberts, Dr. John Davis, and Beth Cruzy, today's presenters. Craig Roberts is an epidemiologist and physician assistant with more than 30 years of clinical and research experience in public health and infectious disease. He holds an appointment as an emeritus clinical assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he worked as a manager and clinician in the sexual health clinic at University Health Services. An expert in sexually transmitted infections, he consults and lectures frequently on topics related to college population health and infectious diseases of young adults. Dr. Davis is an infectious disease physician and clinical educator with a focus on immunocompromised hosts such as patients living with HIV. Dr. Davis's educational interests and activities span the spectrum of medical education from undergraduate and pre-professional education, including medical education and residency or fellowship training, through to continuing medical education for experienced physicians. He currently serves as the Associate Dean for Medical Education at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Beth Cruzy is a nationally recognized author, speaker, and expert advisor in the field of sexual and reproductive health and family planning and brings 25 years of experience in providing direct services for low-income and underserved clients, including adolescents from diverse ethnic, racial, and cultural backgrounds. As the lead clinician for the Family Planning Program of Public Health Seattle, King County, Beth is part of a team that is passionately committed to prevention, education, and high-quality health care for underserved and homeless youth. Our presenters' full bios are available on ARHP webinar web pages. We're thrilled to have all of them with us today, and I will hand it over to Beth. Beth, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Jessica, and um, thanks to everyone who helped to make this possible, um, specifically the educational grant from Merck, and really, really delighted to be um, in collaboration with um, GLMA and ARHP today. Um, it's a great treat. The disclosures. Um, Dr. Akers, who unfortunately was not able to be with us today, is a recipient of investigator-initiated grant from Bayer Healthcare. Dr. Davis is a consultant for Motive Medical Intelligence, and none of the rest of your committee members or medical writers or program managers have anything to disclose. So for learning objectives, in this final uh, webinar of the series of HPV and special populations, we hope that you'll be able to discuss the burden of HPV infections in sexual and gender minority populations in males and in adolescents, paying special attention to HPV through the lens of intersectionality. To describe the relationship between HPV and cancer, its epidemiology, and the disparities and consequences within vulnerable populations. To explain the benefits of preventive care, such as vaccinations and relevant screening exams, including the guidelines and recommendations for each. And to address barriers to widespread implementation of HPV vaccination in current practice. This would include education, access, consent to care, confidentiality, and administrative issues. So starting out, uh, we want to look at SOGI, or sexual orientation and gender identity, and beyond. Inclusive strategies for client-centered care. One of the first things we want to make sure that we pay attention to is that we not only ask for, but we use each client's preferred name pronouns and anatomical terms, such as chest or breast. Uh, there is also a suggestion that we might want to start using chosen 
rather than preferred in relation to names and pronouns. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Uh, we want to collect a gender-neutral sexual history and provide relevant sexual health counseling. In other words, avoid assumptions about sexual history or behaviors based on a perceived gender or even an explicit sexual orientation. We want to offer cancer screenings in relation to the anatomical organ, for instance, the cervix, and the risk, for instance, anal receptive intercourse or immune status, rather than gender. We want to ask clients to guide the visit. For example, do they prefer more or less detail in explanation of the speculum exam? And we want to request and follow client guidance for minimizing emotional and physical discomfort and for supporting their internal locus of control throughout the encounter. And we would do this using principles of trauma-informed care. So now we're going to move on to the question section. And these are um, the next, the next uh, bit of, excuse me? Oh, the next bit of the webinar um, are a series of slides which include frequently asked questions from uh, all of the folks who came to the preceding webinar. So we'll go slide by slide here. Jessica's going to read the questions, um, and then panelists uh, will jump in with, um, with their responses as inspired. So thank you. Thanks so much, Beth. So our first question to all of you is, how is HPV transmitted between girls and women? Is it the sex toys? Well, <clears throat> I'll take this one. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Short answer. And. Yes, and. Yes, but. Um, although penetration is the number one route for HPV transmission, this can be fingers or sex toys if barriers aren't used or changed appropriately um, in between partners. But HPV is also transmitted by orogenital roots. It's also transmitted skin to skin. Actually, no fluids or mucous membranes are required. Um, and another thing to remember is in women, um, well, in girls, HPV prevalence is 27% in teens, so girls to women, up to 19. And then by the time women reach 20 to 24 years old, the prevalence is 45%. And according to the most recent data on um, uh, youth sexual behavior that just came out this year, there's actually a 7% incidence of female teens who have sexual contact with other girls and women. Um, and that's much higher, actually, than male um, teens uh, activities, either um, with both genders or just exclusively with their, between, with their own gender. Anybody else have anything to, to offer there? Um. So this is this is John. I, I might uh, uh, throw in as well. There, I, I absolutely agree with with all of that, and I think it it underscores the importance of the point um, that Beth just made on on the previous slide, which is uh, about um, really discussing with um, with our patients and clients who come in about what activities. Um, they view as sexual in nature, which ones they don't, and what they engage in. And so really being able to discuss with them and being very open with them about, uh, about what might transmit infection because they might not know. Um, and assumptions might be made even on the part of patients or clients about what may be a risk or not. So, um, so important to, to carry on that conversation. This is Craig Roberts. Beth, I wonder if you might also speculate on the potential role of just hands and fingers um, as, a, as a vector for transmitting, this would really apply to anyone, not just girls and women. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, in the, in the uh, when I first <laughs> first started out, the um, the fingers, fingers as well as sex toys, um, I would think would be definitely involved um, in in transmission. We know that that fomites per se are not thought to be much of a, um, of a worry, but certainly anything that's still uh, warm and moist, not to put too fine a point on it, is certainly going to be able to, uh, to transmit from skin to skin. So. And I know this is a frequent question that comes up in 
many of our conversations and, and talks on this subject. And one of the issues that why we are sometimes a little hesitant to answer a definitive yes or no is because it's largely a data-free zone. There really are not a lot of definitive studies about transmission as there are relatively few people who have only a single um, type of sexual uh, exposure encounter such as with a sex toy and nothing else. So it's difficult to sort of segregate out when two people have in a relationship have an HPV infection, exactly what was the transmission route. Right. Right. Agreed. Thank you, everyone. Our next question is, why would screening rates for HPV-related conditions be different for self-identified lesbians and bisexual or non-heterosexual women compared with heterosexual women? Dr. Davis, do you want to start us off? Sure, happy to. So um, I think w one of the things that we need to, to keep in mind is that there are many barriers to care, um, and not the least of which is barriers to access to care that are experienced by, uh, by sexual and gender minorities. And so that includes um, lesbians and bisexual women, uh, gay men and bisexual men, um, and others. So I'd say um, in particular that, um, that a perception that the healthcare um, uh, fields may not be very, uh, very uh, uh, good at providing care for them, or very open and welcoming, can can be off-putting to to some uh, patients. Many patients have had bad experiences in the past, and so uh, and so those can certainly play a, a significant role here. And then you know, um, in many instances providers may not have the education and some uh, may not know exactly how to approach topics like HPV and other sexually transmitted infections in um, sexual and gender minority populations. And there are sometimes conditions where both providers and even patients themselves sometimes perceive themselves to be at low risk or no risk and so don't seek out routine uh, gynecologic care or do, for example, or doing pap, and, uh, pap smears um, because there's a perception they don't have to worry about it. And so the STD screening may be missed as well as HPV related conditions. Yeah, I think those are definitely all um, really relevant in addition to some of the things that we just talked about in the previous slide where, you know, a, a sexual history actually isn't taken. Um, and the, also the, the influence of uh, stigma or shame, silencing, and a different perception of risk. One of the things that's fascinating to me in the limited research that we have right now um, is in all of the, uh, or in s several different research studies, they use different um, definitions of populations. So uh, in some studies, lesbian is specifically identified as distinct from bisexual, and other studies use women who have sex with women or women who have sex with women or men. There's heterosexual versus non-heterosexual. There's, there's a bunch of different um, distinctions in the studies, and so of course the results end up looking different depending upon how the subgroups are, are teased out. Um, and I was fascinated to see in the um, California Health Interview Survey that just came out this year that the prevalence of cervical cancer itself was actually much higher in what they um, in, in women who self-identified as bisexual. It was a 41 percent um, prevalence. And then lesbian and heterosexual populations were not all that different. Lesbian was 17 percent and heterosexual was 14 percent. So why the, the great increase in self-identified bisexual women, and that's something that, that we just don't know yet, I think. Um. Great. Thanks, everyone. Our next question is, what are some of the disparities in HPV vaccine uptakes for racial, ethnic, and sexual gender minorities? Craig, do you want to take this one? Uh, I can try. So uh, as with many, many other health conditions, there are significant racial disparities, uh, particularly for racial and ethnic uh, 
minorities to blacks, uh, African Americans, Latino men and women, um, the data actually shows that they often have greater rates of HPV related cancers and at the time of the diagnosis may have more advanced disease. There's not as much data about vaccination uh, uh, disparities in racial and ethnic groups, but it does appear that, that those things do exist and many of those are geographic in nature. So there are states that have very significant racial disparities in HPV vaccination rates, for example, um, compared to other states. There have been a couple of studies that looked at this in vaccine uptake in adolescent females. The initiation rates for vaccine were similar across uh, racial groups for females, but the completion rates were much lower for black versus white females. Uh, and I don't think we have a lot of data yet about that in, in males uh, specifically. So a lot of it has to do with you know the, some of the other things we've talked about already in terms of stigma and access to healthcare, using healthcare, and so on. So, Beth yeah. or John? I think um, one of the things that, uh, again, uh, uh, as you say, Craig, there's not very much out about this. There was a, a study that, that just got published in the American Journal of Public Health this year um, that of the 30% of women that were vaccinated in this, um, in this survey, women of color in, in this group seemed less likely to either start or complete than white women, but when they broke it down into different racial groups within women of color, it was really black women who were less likely to start the vaccination series than white women, and there, there wasn't a statistically significant difference in other groups of women of color. And then of the women who started the vaccine, black women had one quarter the odds of completing and Latina women half the odds of completing um, as compared uh, with the white population. And in this study, this was one of the ones where they mixed um, or, or lumped all together the, the um, distinctions of gay, lesbian, and bisexual and found no statistically significant differences according to sexual and gender minority. Um, but in other studies, we know that this is different um, when those, are, um, those categories are teased apart a little bit more clearly. Right. There's, there's also uh, data showing that vaccination rates and completion rates are related to socioeconomic status, um, to more years of high school completed or more years of college completed. Thanks, everyone. Our next question is, aside from lower vaccine rates in some populations, why else might sexual and gender minorities be at a higher risk for HPV-related cancers? John, do you want to start us off? Sure. So, oh, sure. No, that's fine. John, it's fine. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think, like we were just talking about as well, um, and this is also brought out in the... Um, and the Jenny Potter article from the uh, the reference for the the Soji and Beyond slide that, that we covered before that, that Beth talked about. Um, in particular, um, screening is is not always um, well done in sexual and gender minority populations. So, uh, you know, in particular, along with the barriers to access to care, that includes barriers to access to screening. And even when uh, patients are in the office, they aren't necessarily screened effectively. And I think as, as Craig pointed out before, that can be because of uh, a uh, misperception on the part of the provider, on the part of the uh, patient, or both. And so I think both of those can uh, make people at higher risk for later detection of cancers. At the same time, we also know that um, that exposure does make a difference. Um, and so for those who are sexually active, uh, we know that uh, not exposure but and other biological factors in how someone will progress on to um, having complications of infection of HPV. And then um, let's remember that um, sexual and gender minorities in particular are often at higher risk for HIV um, and it as an immunosuppressing condition has definitely been associated with an increasing progression from HPV to some of the complications of HPV like, uh, like cancers and that can be um, anal cancer, not cancer, or cancer, cervical cancer. 
everything sort of this context all sort of comes together in terms of other other risks and other behavioral factors that may influence your risk for an HPV related cancer. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Our next question is if you can't test for HPV in men, why is why is it important that they get vaccinated? And Craig, do you want to start us off? Well, I think it's it's obviously important that everybody be vaccinated, whether you can test for it or not. Um, we might even make the case that because there is no effective screening, vaccination is perhaps even more important. And the example I would probably use is the uh, rather dramatic increase in the incidence of HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancers that we are now seeing. And the group that's the most uh, commonly affected tends to be heterosexual white men in their middle 50s. So there is no screening test for oral cancer or for pharyngeal cancer, HPV-related pharyngeal cancers at this point. The only solution really is immunization. Um, and obviously it, that age group right now can't be immunized. Uh, but one of the values of immunizing um, young men certainly is that we are thinking ahead decades to prevent the incidence of oral cancers in that population. You're here. Yeah. <laughs> if, others, if others want to pipe in about, you know, about certainly other reasons. Um, but it will, we may talk a little bit about screening for anal cancer in, uh, here in a moment as well, but it's a similar s situation and that would apply to young MSM. Um, we need to be immunizing them, you know, at age 11 or 12, and perhaps before they've even formed a sexual identity or be before they become sexually active. And frankly, if we did a good job of immunizing all of our adolescents in this country, we wouldn't be having this webinar, that we wouldn't have these disparities in HPV disease based on your sexual or uh, orientation or gender identity. That's right. <clears throat> Perfect, thanks so much. Our next question is, um, as you predicted, about ah. in the past year. And, and it asks who should be administering anal pap smears and what patients should we prioritize. Do you want to continue on that, Craig? No, I'd like John to, to he's the <laughs> Go for it. Sure, I'll sure. Here. I'll let John start and uh, we, we can add a couple other things. Sounds good. So, um, so I, and again, this is a this is a question that has come up at, at several of the other um, presentations. I think that, that we've all done. So this is this is clearly an area uh, that is it's not only a hot topic, but it is so because I think there are um, uh, there's a lot of interest here, um, and yet we don't have very clear guidelines at the moment about uh, about anal pap smears and screening. And and just to be very clear, this applies to not only men who have sex with men, but anyone um, who engages in um, in some t some form of anal contact during sex, and that would include people who obviously identify as straight, um, and includes you know women who identify as straight who who or um, or heterosexual who uh, may engage in in receptive anal intercourse. So um, the the point is though that um, so whom whom should we be screening? And I think the correct answer if if one is um, asked this on a board style exam um, is that anal pap smears are not currently indicated or recommended um, by the national guidelines. Now that said, there are individual states that have gone on record as saying that anal pap smears may be important for particular populations, such as men who have sex with thin, especially if they're HIV positive given the rates of anal cancer that we have seen in some populations. Um, now, that said as well, I think one of the things that, that is important to keep in mind is that if someone is deciding whether or not to perform an anal pap smear, there's, of, of course, the, the skill part of it, which is the do I know how to do this, and the second part, which is, well, what do I do with this test result when I get it back? And in general, if there's an abnormality, the next step in most algorithms, um, especially those uh, uh, pushed forth by San Francisco and others, by Joel Polesky, et cetera, um, would recommend that uh, people who have an abnormal pap smear that comes back or a result, cytology result, would then be referred for high resolution anoscopy. And that's not something that is readily available at every um, center where there might be screening done. So I think that um, that needs to be sort of borne in mind. Um, and at the same time, there are conflicting data about the utility of high-resolution anoscopy and some of the further follow-up in terms of decreasing 
um, some of the anal cancer complications, et cetera. So, uh, you know, until there's, I think, more definitive data, we're probably going to be left in this kind of gray zone uh, about this where some centers have clearly gone forward and adopted this and even have set up things like high-resolution anoscopy clinics um, and others who have, have chosen um, have chosen not to. So um, anyway, broad broad discussion, but Craig, thoughts? Um, excellent summary. I, I, I would just add a couple things. I think there is a, tends to be a, a fairly broad consensus that HIV positive people generally are the primary, are the groups that would be prioritized for anal pap screen. Even if there isn't a national guideline, there seems to be some consensus, I think, among uh, HIV specialists that that's important, uh, particularly as we know persons with HIV have a much, much greater risk of developing cancers in for MSM, particularly a 30-fold increased risk for developing anal cancers. Uh, so that to looks to be like a particular subgroup that would be important to be screening. Uh, and there is currently a, an ongoing clinical trial in place to evaluate the uh, uh, need for screening and how it's done, uh, particularly for anal, HPV-related anal cancers. And I, that's being led by uh, Joel Plevsky and others. Great. So I, yeah, yeah, and I think clinics. If you're doing it, just to reinforce what John said, if you if you're doing anal paps and if you want to do them, then you really need to have this system in place to manage them. Uh, and there are not clear guidelines about how to manage them. And you know who, what do you do with ASCUS reports? What do you do with dysplasias? It's different than how we manage cervical cytology, for which we have years of data and millions of women in clinical trials, we sort of really have worked out those algorithms really, really well. Um, for anal disease, it's very different and it tends to be much more center by center in terms of how those are managed. Um, so the question of what age would you start doing this, how often should you do it, who should you do it, those are largely things that are not well worked out. And then I might I might throw in on top of that then to to remember though that just because we're all focused on on anal pap smears um, that that there are other screening mechanisms in particular physical exams so visual inspection digital rectal exam even low resolution or in office um, uh, anoscopy so all of these are are ways of of looking for lesions and and detecting those um, that can be very helpful as well. I think that's a really, um, that's a great point, John. Thanks for, for bringing that up, too, because there's a lot of folks, again, when we get back to doing actually a careful sexual history, a lot of people are having uh, anal receptive sex that, um, that might not otherwise disclose that if we weren't actually talking about it. And so um, the idea of um, bringing, bringing the anus back into the exam, I think, is an excellent uh, concept. Yeah, and and I, I just I guess maybe one other last thing, and I think this is just a a recent thing, a maybe last issue of Journal of Infectious Diseases, um, the uh, HPV in men study I think was looking at um, uh, at rates of HPV, including in people who um, who never had uh, anal sex, and it's just important to remember that uh, in, it was a non-zero number, it was a low number, but a non-zero number of, of patients of men actually did have anally detected HPV. Uh, and so, I, again, I think, you know, there is a, there's a field effect, um, and, and in general, to remember that uh, transmission can happen in a lot of different ways, including, you know, perhaps auto-inoculation from other sites. So, um, so again, screening is uh, is important with the with the things and tools that we do have. Perfect. To continuing on continue on the screening topic, our next question asks: When and why should I screen transgender patients? <laughs> All right. I guess I'll I'll continue a little bit on this one. Um, so, again, our our trans patients. Um, deserve all the same screening as other patients do. Um, so all of our patients deserve screening, and, and in particular, screening that is appropriate uh, to the anatomic uh, uh, needs of that patient. And so that, again, requires taking an appropriate history um, to ask our trans patients where they are in the process of use, uh, for instance, because we do know that, uh, for instance, in, uh, in 
uh, trans women that that, um, that surgically constructed neovaginas can be infected with HPV. Um, and obviously in our trans male populations, uh, anyone who retains a cervix is still at risk of cervical cancer. Um, and, so, uh, and so taking that history and doing um, anatomically appropriate screening is important. Now that said, there are some, uh, there are some uh, aspects to the uh, screening process itself that need to be borne in mind, in particular for people who have had um, surgeries, that the screening process itself may be very uncomfortable for any of a number of, of anatomic and, and psychological reasons, so um, making sure to really engage uh, the patients or clients in their in their care um, and in in negotiating sort of what is appropriate uh, uh, for the for the exam itself. For instance, some some clinics have gone to allowing patients uh, to to gather their own specimens, and in fact, there's some emerging data to say that that the uh, that the accuracy of those particular self uh, directed screens or self-obtained screens may be just as high as as clinician uh, obtained screens. So, so it's just important to to engage people in that particular um, that discussion. But I think uh, again, um, all patients deserve screening um, uh, for HPV if they are active and at risk for HPV. And, and in terms of the schedule and answering the question of when uh, for for persons with a cervix, the schedule is. is the same. So you start at age 21 and it's every three years if you're negative and add uh, HPV, you know, DNA testing at age 30 is an adjunct. So there, the guidance, there's no difference in the scheduling of recommendations for cytology screening based on gender. Great, thank you. Our next question is, again, related to transgender patients and asks, why is the vaccine important in transgender patients? Are female to male patients at a higher risk than male to female, or should we recommend the vaccine to both? Well, that's an easy question. I think, that, yes, of course, you should recommend the vaccine to both. The vaccine should be recommended to everyone. One thing, uh, for the reasons we've already talked about, in some cases, transgender people may be at higher risk of HPV disease and complications, and actually ACIP has recently recognized that by adding transgender as a sort of as this high risk category, where the vaccine is now indicated through age 26 routinely for transgender persons, as it is also for men of sex with men, and for HIV and other immunocompromised persons. I completely agree. Likewise. Great. Our next question is, should we be integrating HPV prevention counseling into routine STI screening? Beth, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, yeah, this is it's interesting because as we go through the webinar, I'm, I'm hearing, um, for instance, that self-insertion of speculum is, a, is an old-school feminist um, principle. And, and again, integrating HIV prevention counseling is, should be kind of old-school here, that, um, that a routine STI screening should be including discussion of uh, sexual activity and behaviors and prevention strategies and safer sex practices. Uh, HPV is, is as a specific infection, I think it can be kind of confusing and alarming um, to a lot of people because there's, there isn't so much information about it. There's a lot of buzz about it, but I think there's a lot of missing information. So I think in terms of just providing that education and desensitization and including it, in the discussion of the possible infections that can be transmitted between people, how common it is, how often it is that it is spontaneously cleared and not necessarily um, something dire, but as with many other infections, it can be um, dangerous and definitely worth taking steps uh, to prevent the, the risk of having a persistent disease or something that could turn into cancer. And I think it also um, helps to, uh, as a discussion about vaccine that really we don't have a vaccine for anything else. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing. 
but that's, I think, you know, part of that discussion is just bringing it into the realm of things that we already talk about and using the, um, the pros and cons that we have to, to make a well-rounded discussion with our clients. All right, great. We'll jump right into our next question. How can we best approach counseling a poly, non-monogamous, or pansexual client about HPV and other STIs? John, would you like to take this one for us? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, when, when we start, um, I, I think I'll, I'll kind of riff a little bit off of what, um, what Beth was just talking about um, in the last question, which is, um, I think approaching this maybe more holistically is, is the way to go, it is that, um, in other words, there's not a lot of reason, especially with respect maybe to HPV, um, that um, counseling a polyamorous person or a pansexual uh, person um, would require something necessarily different from the way one counsels heterosexual um, uh, uh, patients or clients. So. I think the, the point is to engage them in uh, a discussion about sex, healthy sexual behaviors, and uh, again, you know, if, if one chooses to, to embrace the, um, the 5P model of, of the CDC, that's, that's certainly a, a way to go or, or others, but the idea is to engage in, in some kind of discussion of what practices um, are going on, what the concerns on the patient or client side are about sexually transmitted infections, um, and then how to um, reduce that perceived risk, and then to educate about risks that may not necessarily be perceived, um, and be able to, to hopefully provide information so that patients can make their own most informed decisions. So again, really helping with the agency of the patient and, um, uh, and, and part of their autonomy. So. I don't know, Beth, Craig, others who have seen. No, I think, right. I, yeah. yeah, it just it makes me think of a um, a friend of mine, who's a trans guy back in the in the nineties um, was was on the early part of his journey and didn't identify as male at that time and was involved in a study here um, in Seattle at Harborview and was kind of offended at the suggestion because he had multiple partners that he was at higher risk um, for infections and his point was they didn't ask me what my practices were. I have like <laughs> stellar safer sex practices. Yes, I have multiple partners but I'm really, really good about my safer sex practices because I'm really sex positive and I really believe in communication and I really believe and practice all of these these techniques that keep me and my partner safe and he said you know there's a lot of people um, out there who are uh, practicing serial heterosexual monogamy that don't practice safer sex at all and are actually at a much higher risk than I am for a variety of infections. So I think that's, you know, that's what plays in for me to, to these, uh, these kinds of approaches. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Our next question is, how do you link youth to the importance of the HPV vaccine? What kind of easy to understand messaging on the importance of the vaccine do you use? And I'll throw this one to either Craig or Beth first. Um, well, briefly, I, uh, I don't do a lot of work with youth, so I don't have a lot of experience with this question, but I certainly think emphasizing this as a, uh, particularly as a cancer prevention vaccine, uh, and involving youth, and it, depending on their age and their certainly their sexual experience, um, to talk about how it's related um, and how important this vaccine is in terms of preventing uh, the complications of this infection. Yeah, it's an interesting um, uh, working with adolescents on this is interesting. There's, I think, some you guys probably know more than I do, but there's, I think, there's some information about. Um, messaging around vaccines for teens and, and I've found just anecdotally that it's a place where 
the teens that I'm working with around other topics for their sexual health and reproductive health are very, very comfortable and confident making their own decisions as autonomous individuals. And then we get to a vaccine discussion, and it's the only place where they say, I'm going to ask my mom, or I'm going to ask my dad, or I'm not sure if I got that or not, let me find out and I'll get back to you, or, I mean, it's really, there's, a, there's much more hesitation there. Um, and uh, sort of a, a routing back. I think that teens think of vaccines as something that their parents take care of, and so it's a, it throws them a little bit um, to be asked about vaccines in teen clinic. And, um, and in terms of the whole future thinking that the developmental brain, the cancer consequence, I think is kind of remote for them. Uh, so it just, it, it tends to be, I sort, of, I sort of circle around and touch on different things and see what, what might spark uh, some, you know, a spark in the eye or an interest or an expression on the face. It's like, oh, let me follow that trail. And, and it might be warts. Yeah. Um, so just kind of uh, really working with the individual and seeing where they're, um, what seems to resonate with them and following that track. Thank you. Beth, do you want to continue talking about how you respond to parents' concerns about the HPV vaccine for their children? Well, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not really very, I won't be very helpful at this one because um, I'm, I work in a, a family planning clinic and teen clinic and parents aren't allowed mostly, so uh, <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of experience. <laughs> Yeah. With, uh, with working with parents. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass this on and see if one of my colleagues might have some help for me it, here. I, um, I actually kind of felt like I wanted to punt on this too, but mostly because um, this is a topic that would be an entire hour on itself, um, and we have a lot of other questions to go through yet this, uh, this afternoon. But I would point people, that we did uh, in our master slide deck that we have available on the ARHP website, two slides uh, addressing this question specifically. Uh, with suggestions for wording and some other things. But basically, um, it's important to listen to parents, it's important to talk to the parents about what their concerns are, and just factually um, address those concerns as they come up. So whether it's about vaccine safety or the need or, or you know, what, what's the benefit of this vaccine and so on. So you just have to be honest. You should not dismiss parents' concerns. It's very important to acknowledge them and just simply address them as they come up. Yeah, I'll say I'm I'm also an adult infectious disease doctor, so I don't uh, I don't routinely deal with with parents all that much. Um, but I will say that even so, um, even in, in some of my adult population, uh, I will say that there are times when I come across uh, a lot of uh, sort of negative attitudes toward vaccines in general. And so I think I, I agree, it is important to to hear those out, hear them where they're coming from and really be able to, to try to, to provide information to help them. Again, if they're, um, you know, in our motivational uh, interviewing language, if they're pre-contemplative, then it's not really going to happen that day. But again, it, it, it requires giving information and allowing them to start thinking about it um, to, to try to move them along. Yeah, and I think that this might be a population where the cancer uh, prevention part might be a, a, a powerful incentive. Great, thank you. Our next question is, why did the recommendation change from 9 years old to 11 to 12 years old? Well, I can answer that. Um, it hasn't. So the ACIP recommendation for who should get the vaccine has always been routine immunization at age 11 or 12 or as young as 9 years old. So the FDA has approved the vaccine for persons 9 through 26 years of age. That means you can give it at any of those years, but 11 or 12 is a common adolescent platform where adolescents have other um, uh, medical visits, and in particular they also get a, uh, the uh, Tdap vaccine and uh, quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine. So that's why ACIP sort of settled on this age 12 recommendation for routine immunization, um, but there are certainly are clinics and places that are giving it at nine years old, and there's no reason why you can't give it at nine years old. There is a supplemental recommendation that uh, children, adolescents with a history of child abuse should be immunized at nine years old. Okay, 
and not wait until 12. Great. Our next two questions cover the HPV vaccine in adults. Um, what type of adult patient over 26 years old would you recommend the vaccine to? And what about adults in HPV? Do we even recommend vaccinating patients over 26? Well, the vaccine is not indicated for anyone over the age of 26. That's, so giving it to someone who's 27 and older would be an off-label use of the vaccine. So that would be a sort of a provider by provider or clinic by clinic recommendation or decision. Um, so we would not specifically recommend that. There are certainly patients who request it and it's, uh, there are no theoretical uh, safety concerns with giving the vaccine over the age of 27. There is some data from Merck and others uh, where it has been used, um, and I know at least a, one study in women through age 45. It does appear, though, as the older you are when you receive the vaccine, the less efficacious and less immunogenic it is. So there would be some question about immunizing, for example, a 35-year-old woman. Um, it may not simply work as well as it would in a 15-year-old. And so you may not, ex in, in part because that 35-year-old that may have already had other HPV infections in her life um, and the vaccine won't affect, you know, an existing infection or change the course of an existing infection. And I don't know if you, if you guys want to, so we do in our clinic, we provide and patients more than anything else. And I should also add then typically it's not going to be covered by insurance because it is an off-label use of the vaccine. So I would, I guess I will jump in and say um, I need to do the same sort of thing in my clinic and I'm mostly in, uh, well since I'm an adult, my patients are over 26, not all, but, um, but most. And so uh, for patients that I do see who are over 26, I have this is that um, the new vaccine, which I think we'll get to later, um, is a nine-valent vaccine. So it covers a lot of different types. And though uh, through, uh, you know, a sexually active person may have been exposed to, um, to some of the types, the chances that they've been exposed to all of the subtypes is a bit smaller. Um, and so, so there is, you know, perhaps some uh, theoretical basis for, for efficacy. I know the, um, the, the Vivian study was just, was just released, which now looked at not just immunogenicity um, in those who are older, which has been shown in, um, it's already been shown in women and has been shown in men as well. Um, I think there's the, the middle-aged men study. Um, but, but the Vivian study was actually now released in The Lancet looking at, um, and at, at other clinical endpoints, which included um, uh, persistence or carriage of HPV over time. Um, as well as uh, as atypical um, uh, cytology in in women, um, and there was demonstrated to be some efficacy in those who were um, who were vaccinated over age 26. So so I think again this is an evolving area, and it's it's not something where um, where the FDA uh, approval is going to change uh, soon. I think, or the and certainly not the ACIP recommendations. Uh, uh, but I think this is an area worth watching and and keeping an eye on because. Um, there are, again, some providers who are, are providing this to their patients who ask for it and who, who have the means to afford it. Let's be clear about that, too. Uh, but uh, at the same time, um, I think um, that, that there will be changes coming up. I have a question. <laughs> is, there, is there yet any um, evidence in decreased oropharyngeal cancers following vaccination, and is that something that might potentially be an indication for, um, for folks over 26? So I'm, I'm not aware of, of any, uh, any data about that clinical endpoint. I know I've seen information out about, um, uh, about sort of not only immunogenicity with respect to um, let's say antibody levels in the blood, but uh, but also expression of antibodies in oral mucosa, 
so it's site specific and I know I've seen that data out that show that it is effective um, so so that with with some uh, presence of, of immunity that is site specific like that there's the hope of course that that will lead to um, to clinical um, relevance and outcomes but I've not seen that yet mm, thank you John I don't know Craig I don't know if you if you've seen anything. No, I've, I have not seen anything either um, and it's part of the reason was the uh, the incidence of oral cancer uh, 15 years ago when these vaccine studies were initiated was kind of off the radar in many ways. Um, and so it was really never even considered in the early studies. And, and, uh, and of course, just like cervical cancer and anal cancers, it often probably is going to take decades from infection to cancer. And there really are no precursors to measure or look at at this point, such as a, a dysplasia, and, which were the endpoints in the original Merck trials and, and GSK trials. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Our next slide reviews just some general HPV vaccine questions. If someone wants to review these briefly before we talk more about the latest guidelines. Sure. I can uh, just go over these real quickly. These are some of the more typical questions that we've been getting in our um, talks um, and we put the answers up here right away so that you can just sort of review them. This is fairly standard. Um, as with other vaccines, you don't start over, you just finish the series even if those doses in some cases may be years apart. Uh, for someone who uh, with, the newer, with the new and current vaccine, the 9-valent HPV, if, you seeing, if you're seeing a patient who's come in and needs her, his or her second dose or third dose and they received quadrivalent vaccine originally, they can and should get the nine-valent vaccine now. You don't need to uh, track down quadrivalent vaccine uh, uh, and for one thing you're probably not going to be able to find it. And then uh, the biggest question perhaps is with the new, va new vaccine is should you get boosters with this vaccine? Should you start over if you've completed a three-shot series with quadrivalent vaccine? And there is currently no recommendation from ACIP or others to be re-immunized with the nine-valent vaccine. It's thought that the additional benefit of those five types for people who received uh, the full series before is not going to be enough of a benefit to justify the cost. Great. Thanks so much. Craig, do you want to go into a few more details about the latest guidelines? Sure. Of course, so, that these will also be on core, depending on how much the, uh, So the biggest news was the approval last week uh, by, excuse me, two weeks ago by ACIP and early in October by FDA of a new two-dose schedule for, recommend, for uh, routine immunization in girls and boys who are 9 to 14 years of age. This has been done in other countries for several years now, and the United States so is sort of finally catching up with the rest of the world. Um, it's been determined that actually giving that second dose, uh, if you give them at least six months apart, two doses has equivalent efficacy in terms of immunogenicity to a three-dose series. The antibody kinetics are identical. Uh, the key is that those two doses have to be given um, six months apart and ACIP has said that the minimum time between doses must be at least five months or 22 weeks. And this is only for persons under the age of 15. So that first dose has to be given before the 15th birthday, and then the second dose can be given between six and 12 months later. And that range was actually going to be used so that to assist pediatricians who may, and parents for that matter, who may find returning within a year difficult. So this is a way to sort of ease the schedule and if people are going to come in once a year, for example, you could just do it um, those two doses a year apart. Um, but if the first dose is given on or after the 15th birthday, then the adolescent would still need the full three doses under the sort of the standard or old schedule that we used to use. And the last bullet point is that immunocompromised persons will still need three doses regardless of age. This has not yet been published by ACIP, so there may be some uh, some changes to their final wording, and I just wanted to put in that caveat. However, it, because this is FDA approved, it is now part of the label, part of the indication for the vaccine, the, for the nine-valent vaccine, and you can start doing this right now. If you have a, a, 
a 12 year old coming into your clinic today, you should advise that parent or that child to get their second dose in six months rather than coming back in a month to get their second dose. So this really should be implemented immediately for new patients who are starting their immunizations under the age of 15. A couple other things, so people who've received only two doses but less than five months apart, they will still need a third dose, even if they're 12 years old. If they're coming in, you can't tell them two doses is good enough if they were only given a month apart. Uh, and then anyone who received their first dose again after the age of 15 will still need a third dose. But if people have documentation of having at least their first dose before age 15, even if it was years ago, um, as it appears now, you would not need to get a third dose. You would just give a second dose. And finally, just uh, there are three vi vaccines that are licensed in the United States, but uh, from a practical standpoint, the first two are no longer available. So GSK has pulled their bivalent vaccine from the U.S. market, and Merck has discontinued sales of quadrivalent vaccine and discontinuing manufacturing in the United States of the quadrivalent vaccine as of today. Uh, I believe is the date is the end date. So going forward from this point in the United States, anyway, only the nine valent HPV vaccine will be available for use. And again, it will now either be a two-dose or a three-dose series depending on age and indicated and approved for both men and women 9 to 26 years of age. And I think that was it for our uh, fixed questions. So if we have enough time, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions from the audience and Caitlin, Caitlin or uh, Jessica. Perfect. Thanks so much. So we do have a couple more minutes for questions. Our first one is from Dr. Asma Vicker. If sexually active females are getting warts on their face and neck, are they more prone to HPV genital warts? This is Craig. I think that's a fascinating question, and I don't have the answer, but I will tell you that anecdotally, uh, many patients I've seen with genital warts as, uh, as young adults have told me that they have been susceptible to common warts throughout their life that they and I think there probably is some perhaps uh, immune or host susceptibility to HPV infections expressing themselves and growing but I don't have any uh, I've not seen any data to really support that but I can tell you I, I have seen that anecdotally and I'd be interested to know if others um, John or Beth if you have any thoughts on that Yes, yeah, so this is John, and I will say that I've I come from exactly the same space, which is I have anecdotally seen that, and again, I think there are some reasons one might um, hypothesize that that would be the case from a from an immunologic and pathophysiologic standpoint. But I guess I don't know of any data to show that yes, if you find someone who has, let's say, uh, you know, penile warts or uh, or um, you know, cervical atypia, does that mean that they are at higher risk for oropharyngeal cancer? So I've not seen that data. Right. And it would be important to point out there that warts uh, and cancer are not related. Uh, warts or genital warts are caused by low risk type 6 and 11, which generally do not have any oncogenic potential. Right. And those are different from even then from others, like, let's say plantar warts or, or others that are caused by usually type, what's type 1, I believe. So again, there's, there are over 100 different types of HPV. Um, so there are some things that they obviously have in common. And from a host standpoint, immunologically, there, there may be um, problems that people might have with fighting off um, particular, um, uh, the, the, the overall family of, of HPV. But, uh, but again, I don't, I'm not aware of data. Great, thank you. Before we wrap up, John, uh, Dr. Davis, would you like to review the key points for the participants? Okay, all right. So um, I think uh, just just the one of the most important I think that we have is, and it's why it's up at the top there, is the two-dose schedule is now recommended. That's a really big update um, and has been demonstrated to have equal immunogenicity um, to the three-dose um, standard schedule. So um, otherwise, keeping in mind that HPV is um, the most common sexually transmitted disease in the U.S., which is part of why we're talking about it, um, and understanding that um, that it also causes cancer, which is a, a very important thing. Um, and then of the uh, cancers that are caused by HPV, or at least are attributable to HPV, um, important to remember that the vast majority of those um, are preventable with the nine-valent HPV vaccine. Um, 
understanding transmission um, comes from taking an appropriate sexual history and anatomical history um, from all of our patients, and that includes um, uh, from those of, of sexual and gender minorities, um, and that uh, there are some important barriers um, to HPV information and care, um, which include um, cost, accessing um, insurance, confidentiality, stigma, et cetera. Um, that particularly affect um, those of, of sexual and gender minority status. Um, at the same time, as we talked about before, immuno, the immune system plays a role here, and so those who are immunocompromised um, and who have um, anal sex, um, especially receptive anal sex, are, are much more likely to develop HPV-related cancers, um, which uh, helps to explain the concerns that, uh, that most of us have about um, uh, HIV-positive men who have sex with men or uh, or our trans population, um, especially trans women, that HPV screening and testing is is really only approved um, for cervical uh, cancer. That for the our cervi uh, cervical screening, um, as a site screening goes, that we don't really have um, good HPV screening and testing for things like oropharyngeal, as as you heard um, the panel mention earlier. But that uh, but that you know we are in the process of of I think. Um, shifting a bit on anal cancer and, and likely uh, national guidelines will sometime soon be available to help us with, uh, with how we approach um, anal cancer screening. Uh, remembering that the optimal time to get the HPV vaccine, as you heard um, Craig mention before, is, is prior to HPV exposure, again in the 11 to 12 year old time frame um, or as young as 9. Um, uh, and that the vaccine series, um, as we summarized before, is two um, or three um, injections, depending on which um, group you fall into. Um, and that we do have some emerging evidence um, to suggest that HPV vaccine may be beneficial to women over 26 and, and perhaps even men. So stay tuned to that. Um, and hopefully there'll be some information on that uh, coming out shortly. Great. Thank you so much again for joining us, Craig, Beth, and Dr. Davis. Before we end today's webinar, I'd like to share a few important reminders. Please be sure to visit ARHP.org to view the previous webinars in this series on HPV. As a reminder, you will receive an email from Caitlin Borthwitz in about an hour containing a link to the post-test survey. Your CME or nursing CE certificate will be generated at the end of that survey. Be sure to print the certificate before closing the internet browser. If you have questions, just email us at education at arhp.org. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you will take part in other live and on-demand sessions hosted by ARHP. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone.